Uh -huh. We're good to go now. So uh, in this talk, we're going to just, this is really geared towards non-scientists, so pardon me if I'm a little too basic level, but we're going to go over to some of these eclipse basics, how and why they happen, uh, the astronomy behind it. And I'm going to talk about some of the potential <coughs> eclipses in history, uh, just give a couple examples. I'll show some examples of eclipses and, and uh, fine art, music, literature. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about eclipses and weather and climate go together, especially climate change and sea level rise, which is a really great story. Uh, so with that, we're going to get started. Some eclipse basic, basics. There are several different types of eclipses. There's a total eclipse, which we're going to have uh, on August 21st. Uh, there's an annular eclipse where the, the moon doesn't completely cover the sun, and you still get some light from the edges. And then there's the partial eclipse. Uh, lunar eclipses, there's only partial and total, because when you get a total eclipse, the, the Earth is much bigger than the moon, and it's completely covered. Uh, the geometry of why that happens, so we've all seen this before, I think, but uh, the, because the sun is much larger than the Earth, the, the area of complete shadow, called the umbra, is, is conical in shape. And because the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, uh, when you have an, a solar eclipse where it's closest to the sun, you'll get a total eclipse where the umbra actually intersects the Earth's surface. Uh, when it's farthest away from the sun, we have an eclipse, but the umbra uh, disappears before it hits the surface, and you get an angular eclipse. And then this wider shadow from the sun that is is called the penumbra, and that's where you get a partial so why are eclipses so infrequent? The moon goes over near the sun every month. Well, it's because the moon's orbit around the Earth is not in the same orbital plane as the Earth's around the sun. There's about a five degree incline. So most of the time, when you have a new moon, which is when you have a, a solar eclipse, or a full moon is when you have a lunar eclipse, it's not in the same plane. So the shadows miss the Earth. However, twice a year, the, the moon's orbit around the Earth intersects the Earth's elliptical plane. These are called nodes, and that's when it's favorable for an eclipse. However, you have to have a new, new moon for a solar eclipse or a full moon for a lunar eclipse during one of these nodes to actually get a, an eclipse. That's why they're relatively rare. But they're really not that rare. On average, a, total eclipse uh, occurs somewhere on Earth every 18 months. Also, for any one place, the return period is around 360 years. And this is a great resource from NASA. You can go onto their website and they have maps by decade going back thousands of years in the past, even thousands of years in the future, of where the eclipse paths will occur. And this is a map from 2000 through 2020. Uh, here you can see the path of the one that's going to occur Monday, starting up in the Pacific Northwest and exiting the country around Charleston, South Carolina. Some other basics, uh, what you can see during a solar eclipse, you, you see all this uh, corona of the sun and the different features that I don't know a lot about, but they're, they're shown here. Uh, that's what you'll be able to see during a total eclipse. And, what I'm asked about most often is about the glasses. Yes, you got to have glasses to see an eclipse. Uh, make sure they're approved by the uh, American Astronomical Society. And the other thing is, you can take them off when the sun, when the moon is, uh, the sun is completely covered. You can take them off and see the corona. But as soon as it starts to peek back out, put the glasses back on. Now here's something that's just really cool if I can get it to play. I don't know why that I won't play. This was supposed to you can Google it. This was a, a geostationary satellite image of an eclipse over the Pacific Ocean last year, over the South Pacific. And you can see the shadow uh, transect the whole hemisphere as this eclipse occurs from the geostationary satellite. Really cool animation. Uh, 
you'll probably run into it. Well, eclipses can also affect the local weather. Uh, here's a temperature trace from an eclipse uh, in Africa showing a 10 degree drop in temperature uh, as, as we were in the total eclipse and under the moon's shadow. Uh, a study in the UK last year also showed uh, that winds can be changed due to this localized change in temperature. Uh, both the speed and direction of the winds can be changed during the eclipse. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And they did this study in the UK because they had a lot of citizen scientists submitting their observations during that eclipse. Well, NASA's doing the same type program through their, their GLOBE program. They have an app where citizen scientists are encouraged to take temperature readings and some other readings and submit them through this app. So NASA's going to have a large database of uh, meteorological conditions across the country as this eclipse approaches. Now let's talk a little bit about some uh, cool eclipses in history. Uh, first, some of the first recorded eclipses. Uh, there's the Ugarit eclipse. Uh, it was uh, recorded on a clay tablet found in uh, uh, in the this old coastal uh, settlement in what's now modern day Syria. And uh, from the writings on this tablet, and also by looking at when eclipses could have possibly occurred, it was determined it was probably March 5th, 1223, before the Common Era. Uh, we also have records of an early Chinese eclipse in 1302, before the Common Era. Uh, it was described on inscriptions found in a tortoise shell, uh, which were kind of mystical, and they, those were called orc bones, but there was a description of the sun going, uh, going dark. Especially in ancient times, these, these were very mystical occurrences. They were tied into the gods and stuff. In, in China, uh, the emperor was was closely tied to the sun, so if an eclipse occurred, the emperor had to jump through a lot of hoops to show that he hadn't displeased the sun god. Uh, fast forward, here's a very influential eclipse. Uh, uh, we call it Einstein's eclipse in 1919. Uh, the, his theory of relativity was fairly new, uh, only a few years old, not gained wide acceptance. But uh, part of the theory of relativity says that in a large enough gravitational field, light will bend. The problem is, we don't have a large enough gravitational field to observe this except for the sun. So, uh, what was his name? Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington set up a very careful observation uh, during the eclipse of 1919. He uh, was able to see the displacement of stars near or even behind the sun during the eclipse, proving that light did indeed bend by the proper amount, and it was after this that the theory of relativity gained widespread acceptance. I don't have the time to do this one, but this is a great legend story of the Tecumseh, uh, a really great uh, Shawnee Indian chief uh, in the Ohio Valley, and he was said to predict this eclipse. But if I have time, we'll go back and bring this to it. Eclipses in modern art, this is just, or fine art, this is just one example. Uh, it's depicted like this quite often. Uh, this is a painting by Peter Paul Rubens of the Crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, in, in the New Testament, it says the sun went dark for three hours when he died. And so that's commonly associated with eclipses. And here you see the, the moon beginning to cover the sun as he's led up to the hill, and then complete darkness as he's died. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about eclipses in modern music. I have a top five list, uh, or top four list, with a grand winner. Uh, it includes Blinded by the Light by Man for Man's Earth Band. One of the very few songs where the cover was actually better than Bruce Springsteen's original. Uh, another one was Eclipse, of course, by Pink Floyd on their landmark album, Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, there's even Harley Simon in her 
big hit, You're So Vain, she talks about going up to Nova Scotia in your Learjet to see a total eclipse of the sun. But the clear winner has to be Bonnie Tyler, total eclipse of the heart. <laughs> if you're an aficionado of cheesy one-hit wonders, this is on the top of that list too, so it, it had to be the winner. All right, now let's get to the good stuff. Eclipses and climate change. Uh, before we go into it, I, I need to review a little physics. Probably not for this room, but certainly for non-science audience. So we're going to talk about conservation of angular momentum. <laughs> Seriously, never do that. A, a non-science audience will get absolutely nothing out of that. I'm not even sure highly trained scientific audiences get anything out of these kind of slides. So my recommendation is just no. But we will talk about conservation of angular momentum. I'm sure everyone in this room understands it, but let me practice anyway. Uh, angular momentum is simply the angular velocity, or we thought of revolutions per minute, times the moment of, of inertia. The moment of inertia is just how mass is distributed along the radius of the axis of rotation. Uh, more mass further away, greater moment of inertia, less mass in closer, smaller moment of inertia. And the main thing is this angular momentum in the absence of other forcings or friction is conserved. So it's illustrated in all the figure skater illustration. Pull your arms out, greater moment of inertia, you slow down, less angular momentum. Uh, pull them in tight, smaller moment of inertia, greater angular momentum. Well, the Earth works the same way. And before I go into that, I talked about these ancient records of the eclipses. They were, they were really profound events. They were documented carefully in a lot of cultures. So we have pretty good records of the eclipses going back 2,500 years and been poured over. And if you, we also have the ability, if the, assuming the Earth's rotational speed is constant, to calculate the occurrences of the eclipse thousands of years back, thousands of years in the future. However, when you do that, you compare it to the ancient records, it appears that the Earth's rotation has actually slowed a little bit in the last 2,500 years. Uh, by about 4.5 hours, if you add it up in clock time. So what that caused the Earth's rotation to slow? This leads us to uh, Monk's enigma, put forth by the iconic oceanographer Walter Monk back in the early 2000s. Here are the basic mechanisms to slow the, the Earth's rotation. The, the main one is tidal dissipation. The washing back and forth of the tides did, slowly dissipates a little bit of the rotational uh, energy. Uh, also, the, the shape of the Earth is changing. During the ice ages, there was so much mass at the poles, the Earth was actually squashed a little bit. Well, 22,000 years ago, that ice melted, and the Earth has been rebounding ever since. That's called glacial, glacial isostatic adjustment. And that actually goes to lessen the moment of inertia and actually speed up the angular momentum a little bit. And then there's one other redistribution of melt water from, from the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. Because the Earth's rotating, this melt water is going to be redistributed down to the equator, resulting in more mass farther away from the axis and actually a decrease in angular momentum. Monk's enigma, though, is with the very best uh, uh, models of G, the glacial isostatic adjustment, and tidal dissipation, these two alone explain exactly the slowdown. And I think we got, yeah, here's a graph. These are the, this is the time era, era going back 2,500 years of different eclipses. The black line is uh, how much time error you would get from tidal dissipation. Then if you add in the glacial adjustment, you get this red line which exactly matches the record from the eclipse. There's no contribution from the redistribution of meltwater. So that's its enigma. 
We know this ice is melted. We've seen it in sea level rise, but we can't find it in this rotational state. Well, a really good geoscientist at Harvard, uh, Jerry, uh, what's his name, Jerry Mitrovica, he, he found that the, he improved the modeling of the isostatic adjustment by incorporating a more realistic viscosity profile of the magma under the Earth's crust. Basically, we were not accounting for a little bit of slippage because the Earth's crust is on a viscous fluid. By factoring this in, all three numbers added up, and months the enigma was solved. So that's the connection between eclipses and the sea level rise and, uh, and climate change. So that's all I got for now. Thank you and happy new year. Questions for Ed? I have a little fact that you can add to this. Between 1917 and 2117, Tallahassee will have a total of four total eclipses, which is more than any location on Earth. Oh, that's great. I'll, I'll file that one away. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, there, we had one in 1970. 1970, yes. Yeah, and I lived in Panama City at the time, and I would have been, what, six years old? But I don't remember it at all. I don't remember our parents road tripping to see it or anything. I'm, I'm curious about that. I'm going to have to ask my brothers and sisters. Yeah, weren't there two eclipses? Like there was one that he tried to, to observe and, and something went wrong with the observation and then they had to go to like Africa or something. No. But, I, mean, I seem to remember something about that. Let me check on it. The, the, yeah. the article I read just talked about this one, but let me yeah. check on that. I'm pretty sure the first one that they did like on the west coast, like the like northern California, and they something went wrong with their observation and they had to figure out what they were so Another aspect of this 1919 eclipse is it was in the middle of World War I was going on at the time. Yeah. And here you have an English scientist going to an island in Spain to verify a German physicist theory. So science is bigger than politics and wars. Mm -hmm. Let's thank all the speakers.